everyone. It is Friday, January 27th, today on The Final Bar. We will wrap this week. We'll focus on how the markets have evolved. Bit of a sell-off going into the close. We'll debrief on that. Also answer a bunch of your questions from The Final Bar mailbag. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. The stock charts system, our platform was built on three components, excellent tools, uh, education to help you learn how to use those tools effectively, and commentary from experts like John Murphy and Martin Pring and many others to share their words of wisdom and expertise and how they're approaching these markets. There's a lot to learn from those that have uh, have come before us. A lot of my mentors focused on the evidence that is uh, that is unveiled when you analyze price uh, and uh, and and think about what the investor behavior that is implied by the movements in uh, in price action. So you saw a nice move to the upside through the course of this week. Today, instead of finishing on a position of strength, giving us a lot of confidence going into the weekend, of course we turn on a dime and rotate lower. The S and P settling down around forty seventy, still up for the for the uh, for the day. But overall, a bit of a uh, a bit of a weak moment going into uh, into the close here. It's been a lot of earnings that we're going to debrief on, and also. Uh, talk about some of the big picture takeaways, thinking about the last uh, uh, five trading days here. I want to continue on with our Wrap the Week segment and talk about uh, some of the key lessons that we learned through this trading week. I did want to start with a poll. We always have a poll going on our live stream page, also on our social media account. So make sure you follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You won't miss another poll. We asked you recently, where does Bitcoin finish the year 2023? Above 60K, between 40 and 60, between 20 and 40, or below 20. Almost half of you answered between 20 and 40. Uh, all 35% of you, over a third of you said below 20,000, which means, quick math, 82% of you, uh, 81, 82% said uh, below 40,000, right, through the, uh, through the end of 2023, which means only 20%, 19% said above 40,000. I'm going to look at a chart of Bitcoin just to put that into a little visual context, and we'll see how that lines up with the levels that, we, uh, that we're that we seeing here today. Uh, Bitcoin, of course, uh, bottomed out in the 15,500-ish uh, range in November and December. This is after the big acceleration up to you know almost 70,000 here uh, about a year and a half ago. It seems like, seems like a lifetime ago when Bitcoin was at those levels. All the cryptocurrencies obviously shed a lot of their value Found a bit of a floor here in November and now rotated very quickly back to the upside, back above 20,000. So only a third of you said we would end the year below kind of the levels that we're at right now. About half of you said we'd sort of be backing and filling in this range between the low that we uh, established uh, in uh, in November and really the 200 day as the lower end of that range up to 40,000, which would be here, which is sort of that congestion area that we had in the first, uh, first half of 2022. Only 20% of you said we would get above uh, 40,000. So as always, I'm thinking of what the outlier is, right? What would happen if Bitcoin got uh, above 40,000, above 60,000? Is that reasonable? I don't know. Is it possible? 100%. Much like my guest yesterday, David Hunter, talking about aggressive upside targets for the S&P and, and, and uh, targets of, of all sorts for different asset classes. What I love about that kind of conversation is that it stretches your thinking a little bit, shakes you out of the comfort zone. It's very easy to get caught up into a particular narrative. And whether or not you agree with an outlandish target like Bitcoin over 60K or below 20K, cause yourself or focus uh, on uh, and, and force yourself to think about those uh, those outlier targets. It can help you get out of the narrative that you're in. That's what I like about that sort of uh, discussion. We'll continue here our Wrap the Week segment, focusing on what we learned today. The Dow actually finishing almost in the red. It was funny. We started prepping for the show and, uh, and our technical director, Zach, and I were talking about Bitcoin from that moment on, the the chart just started free falling. It's like it's like there was a microphone in the stock charts HQ here 
but we rolled over. Risk assets really came off here in the last uh, 20, 30 minutes of trading. Dow stayed in the green, but just barely. The S&P up about a quarter of a percent. The Nasdaq composite up 1%. The VIX continues to go lower. And I'm thinking of my conversation with Katie Stockton earlier this week. There's a really good one uh, thinking about volatility, thinking about that range in volatility. Her general thesis was we're at the lower end of the range. Most likely that's where you see vol volatility start to increase. That's trying to fit into her more cautious perspective on stocks uh, going forward. For today, it felt like we were going to finish this week with a bullish exclamation point. Now a bit whimpering into the weekend, but volatility continuing to come off today. Interest rates overall higher through the course of the day, although a lot of them came down as bonds rallied a bit uh, going into uh, going into the close. The dollar index really finished uh, not too far from where it was. Not a ton of move in the dollar this week, to be honest with you, although the overall trend has certainly been on a weaker dollar relative to other currencies. A lot of red here on the uh, on the list of commodities. Natural gas eked out a positive day. That's using the UNG, which is a natural gas uh, uh, exchange traded product, but all the others in the uh, in the red and cryptocurrencies. Just barely hanging in the green there. Again, although, again, they've given up a lot of their gains. Bitcoin was spiking up to almost 23,500, back down near 23,000 uh, from above. Sectors here, very briefly, consumer discretionary, the number one sector. Now, you had Tesla up 11%, continuing to follow through after uh, earnings uh, on Wednesday after the close yesterday and today, just accelerating that move to the upside. Certainly a lot of investor optimism going into that report, but very much uh, investor optimism coming out of that report. And you can see that from the strength in the uh, in the chart of Tesla in the short term. Her REITs were second, about 0.9%. Communication services up 0.7%. Energy lag behind here. Energy stocks were down 2% today. Healthcare down 0.7%. Materials down uh, about a third of a percent. You know, I was noticing when I was looking at some of the stocks leading on the way up, uh, leading on the way down, I saw a number of energy names in the bottom 10 list. So these are the 10 worst performers in the S&P 500 today. You'll see names like Valero. Uh, what else is that? Chevron, CVX, obviously one of the big mega cap uh, integrated names uh, on the downside. And also some other ones like Intel. And a lot of the semiconductors actually had a pretty uh, pretty rough day here. We talked about NVIDIA yesterday, but uh, KLAC, uh, Intel, uh, others, I think, have drifted off the bottom 10 list. But a little earlier, I saw some others on, uh, on here as well. American Express with a pretty strong day to the upside. They actually reported earnings before the open today. We'll see how many of those charts we can get to uh, as the, uh, as the, ch as the uh, show continues onwards. Let's look at the last five trading days and just think about what happened market-wise. So we start the clock last Friday, and we're looking at the percent moves in major asset classes using mostly ETFs over the last five trading days. In black, we have the S&P 500 finishing the week up about 2.5%. Very, very close to that, the small cap ETF, the Russell 2000, uh, was up about 2.4%. The only thing that really outperformed the S&P this week was the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ 100 was up almost 5% this week. So a, a rare reversion, I think, when you think about the last 12 months, how unusual to see a growth benchmark doubling the daily returns of a, or, or the weekly returns of a, uh, of a, uh, more broad benchmark. That's certainly what we saw today. Growth over value is uh, was was one of the uh, I think themes of the uh, of the week. Underneath there, we have Bitcoin up two percent in orange. Emerging markets up one point four percent. My conversations with uh, with David Hunter yesterday uh, hit on the dollar and and the dollar weakness. What that means for international markets. Willie Delwich on Tuesday from All Star Charts had some really interesting thoughts about non U S markets. Just a broad advance that we've seen in some of those non U S ETFs where, and, and local indexes as well. To be sure. In red, we have bond prices up about a half a percent. The dollar and gold were essentially flat for the week. Not much change from last Friday. And the worst performer, uh, crude oil prices, actually ended the week down about 2.9%. Uh, Let's look at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. We're going to start with the market trend model, which is my weekly model. I update this every Friday after the close based on uh, Friday closing data. No change today. Uh, three weeks ago, we saw the, uh, actually four weeks ago, we had the short-term model turn bullish. Three weeks ago, that was echoed by our medium-term model uh, turning bullish. They have remained bullish so far every week in 2023. We're only three weeks in, but 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 overall, it's remaining pretty uh, pretty strong here. So we've seen, obviously, a rally short-term strength that builds on sort of that medium-term uh, strength off of the lows in October. My long-term model remains bearish, but it's getting closer and closer to not being the case. And if you look back, some of the significant drawdowns that we've seen in the last 20 years, my, my long-term model turns negative, remains negative after the recovery really is pushing to the upside. So 
in 2019, it didn't happen till late February, which was after we'd all, almost round trip back to the September peak of 2018. In 2020, went negative there in the in the first quarter when we had the sell off into the March low. It took it till early June to finally confirm the uptrend, and again that led to the uptrend through the remainder of 20 and into 21. So, getting that to a bullish sign would be certainly a very encouraging thing. I was asked recently, and I think one of the questions here. Uh, is uh, you know what you would need to see uh, to turn bullish, and boy, it's pretty close here. And a lot of the evidence, again, looking at the weight of the evidence, it's it's certainly way more bullish than bearish when you think about the price characteristics and you think about breadth. And if you focus on breadth, and if you think breadth indicators have value in understanding and and quantifying the underlying strength below the market indexes, it's hard to not be pretty bullish given the broad advance that we've seen and the the improvement in breadth indicators off of the low in October. Look at the daily chart of the S and P 500 here again. With most of my guests, we've looked at this chart and talked about it. And uh, you know, again, I when I'm looking at this week, when I'm uh, preparing my my weekly note for my premium members, which I'll start working on here uh, later this afternoon, I'm struck by the fact that the S and P now has made a higher low, and now is really close to making a higher high. It's not quite done it yet, and so getting above 4100 to follow through there would complete it. And at that point. I don't have anything left to say that this is not a bullish move, right? I mean, I mean, we've pretty much checked every other box. We've now followed through above the 200-day. We've broken above this trend line, which I think is key. We've broken above 4,000. Those are all important levels that we've now eclipsed. The RSI is now above 60, which tells you that, generally speaking, we're showing more strength than weakness. So I, I have to say that the vote of the markets overall is, is bullish over bearish. Uh, getting through 4,100 would be yet another sort of bullet point, maybe that final checkbox in the uh, in the recovery uh, play. And then the question is, what's next? And, and if we do get that next week, 4,325, 4,300, that would take us back to the August peak. That would be 61.8% retracement of the uh, 2022 sell-off. That would be a really not logical next step uh, for this move. Could that be the end of the bullish move off of the October lows? Possibly. We'll have to see what uh, what we learn as we uh, watch those things move higher. Just to finish off here very briefly, then we're going to take a quick break. The breadth conditions, as I mentioned, very strong. This is the chart I'll leave you with. The advanced decline lines, looking at the uh, S&P 500, mid caps, small caps, then this first one closest to the price is the New York Stock Exchange, common stocks only. So on the NYSE, you have a, a bunch of closed-end funds, bond funds, and things like that. You strip all those out, you're just looking at basically equities listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It is a great broad universe covering uh, pretty much all the uh, S&P sectors, uh, pretty well distributed across a bunch of different things. And when that indicator is breaking out, the conditions tend to be pretty positive. So the S&P has not barely, not quite broken above its November peak, but all these other things that I would use to validate it certainly have. And the stronger the breadth conditions, whether or not the indexes show the strength, the strength and the breadth I have found to be a much better determinant of, uh, of the strength of a potential move after that. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. What if you could look beyond price? and identify big moves in the market before they happen. That's why we created the Moxie Indicator Minutes. Hosted by me, T.G. Watkins of Simpler Trading, the creator of the Moxie Indicator. Each week, I'll provide you details about the indicator, what it does, and how it can work for you. Only on Stock Charts TV. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close. I sent out a uh, picture on Twitter earlier this afternoon. We were in the Stock Charts studio testing, getting some things setting up. We're really excited to uh, to move into the studio here very soon once we get things all refined and ready to go. But a lot of really cool plans for this show through the course of this year and beyond. A couple other announcements before we continue on today's show. First off, we're going to do a mailbag here in a bit. We're going to feature all questions from people like you. So keep your questions coming. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. Hope to answer yours live on the air on Monday's show next week. Also go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on demand platform. We have so much great content in terms of our great group of contributors, people like Joe Rabel and Greg Schnell and Tom Boley and Julius DeKempener and uh, Grayson Rose and, uh, and many, many others. 
Also, a lot of special events all available for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. Upcoming schedule next week, as a reminder, Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be doing some more testing in our studio. Uh, so we'll be running the show a little bit later, 6 p.m. Eastern. You can tune in there uh, for our broadcast. Of course, they're all available on demand after uh, the fact later in the evening. Sam Stovall from CFRA Research is going to be coming through on Wednesday. The first will be back live at 4 p.m. Eastern, unpacking and debriefing from Fed Day and thinking about Powell's comments and what uh, the trajectory of Fed move may be uh, going forward. So make, don't miss that uh, discussion with Sam Stovall on Wednesday the 1st. Let's continue on our show today with the final bar mailbag. Keep the great questions coming and let's get to question number one. Dave, can you explain how the SPY $341 point and figure price objective is calculated? And you sent a link. Unfortunately, I didn't get to your question until now. And the price objectives have changed a bit because we've all of a sudden had a, a buy signal. You actually sent the question back here, and you had mentioned a, a downside objective of 341, and that was based uh, back here, uh, right, which was where we were at. Uh, uh, and I think you'd sent the question. It was sort of back in here somewhere. Uh, but so here's what happens, right? When you look at the top of our point and figure charts, you can see the most recent point and figure pattern. Green is a bullish pattern. Red is a bearish one. And it will describe what it is. We'll confirm the scaling. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have this. Is, can't, I can't make a point and figure primer out of the uh, out of the mailbag segment, but uh, I have in the back of my head uh, do some more education on point and figure. So more good things to come. But you're asking about this thing right here, the bullish and it used to be a bearish price objective tentative. So here's how that value is actually calculated. What you do is you actually look at the move and you look at the most recent signal. So if you have a sell signal, which would be a column of O's that moves lower than the previous column of O's, what you basically have to do is take the height of that, uh, of that um, uh, column, right? That column of O's. And then you basically project it to the downside. And, and pretty much the way that I would think of it is you take the height of the column, and I'm totally bringing this out of my deep memory banks at point. I actually used to grade questions on point and figure charts for the CMT exams a long time ago, but it's been about 10 years. So I'm, I'm drawing on it. What I remember is this. I believe what we're doing, uh, and I'm, I'll, I'll check and make sure, is basically taking the height of this pattern, you multiply that by two, and uh, is that right? And then you divide it by the box size, I think that's right, two thirds, and then you divide it by the box size, I think that's right. You multiply it by two thirds times the box size, the threes cancel out, and basically you double the height of this column and you subtract it from the top of the X's. So this is eight O's, you subtract eight O's and another eight O's, and that gets you down to this box. We put 341 because we basically take the lower end of that box and say that's the price objective, just as an easy way to do it. Now we're back to a bullish price objectives, which means you're taking the height of this column because it's the buy column, and you're basically uh, tripling that and taking it off the low of the previous column of O's. So you're basically 5, 10, 15 gets you up to this range. So you can see 448 PO means price objective. And up here, we're actually saying 451 because that's the top, basically the top dollar value in this uh, in this particular box that you're looking at. If everything I just said confused you deeply, I apologize for that. But here's what you can do. Hit the little magnifying glass and type price objectives or point and figure price objectives, and you will get to a really cool chart school article where we explain exactly what the methodology is along with some examples. Um, that we have we have some some things we can do to improve our point and figure engine. It is one of the best out there. It is a it is a very simplistic but actually challenging to program because it's so unique. Uh, but it's a really good way to uh, get rid of the noise and focus on the bigger picture moves. Thanks so much for that question, by the way. Next question. I love this one. How does everyone being fired from their job help the economy? What's the benefit to the Federal Reserve? And you mentioned you know you're, we're getting all this negative uh, you know things about all these companies uh, firing people. How are these you know what is that? Why is that turning into a bullish, bullish take? Right? Why are people buying with all, all that negative, uh, all that negative sentiment? What I have, what has happened, I, I tried to tease this out a little bit with some of my recent uh, conversations, and I think when I meet with Sam Stovall next week on the show, I'll try to bring this up. I'll make a note to, to try to do it. But there are a lot of times when good news is bad and bad news is good for stocks, and here's why. Right? If you think about what the Federal Reserve is trying to do, they're trying to be fairly aggressive over the last. 12 months, arguably, debatable, but they are trying to be fairly aggressive about tightening uh, financial conditions. And the reason why they're doing it is because they need to slow down the economy, 
to, to uh, address inflation, right? And if they can slow down the economy, inflation overheats when economic growth starts to explode and all of a sudden prices have nowhere to go but up. And that's good in that the economy is strengthening, but all of a sudden prices become so high, inflation becomes so out of hand that all of a sudden things aren't super affordable anymore. And we've certainly seen that in a lot of places uh, if, you, uh, if you think about it. What the Fed is trying to do is make things much more restrictive, which is designed to slow down the economy. So what investors are looking at is, are the actions that the Fed has taken over the last 12 months having an impact? And the way you can determine that that's having an impact is you have to look at economic data and see that it actually is slowing. So the more that economic data slows, the more that implies that the Fed's finish line to their tightening is much closer, which means we can get through it, which means the economy can go ahead and heat right back up again. And all these technology companies that had been hiring aggressively like Alphabet and uh, and um, Microsoft and others that are now shedding people, they can start hiring people back as things get better. So you have to remember the stock market is a leading indicator for the economy. So if investors get a sense that the economy is slowing down enough that inflation most likely will follow, that means we can start to think about buying because then you are playing on the next economic recovery going forward. I hope that made sense as to why negative data in terms of economic conditions and uh, and hiring trends is actually more encouraging for stocks because it tells you the Fed may be closer to being done than farther away from being done. Next question. After Tuesday's close, would you consider the S&P 500 to be forming a cup and handle pattern? with a close at 4016. Um, interesting question. Let's take a look here. So you said 4016, which is about here. I th So I'm not sure which one you're talking about, right? There, there are a number of things that kind of are cup and handle-ish. One of them could be this as a big cup, and then this as a little handle. You might be talking a little short stream and thinking about this cup and this little handle. Um, but the, the easy answer is neither of those, I would argue, are a cup and handle pattern. So I guess that's an easy answer. And here's the reason, right? Think about whether you actually had your coffee in this cup and then think about how upset you would be as all the liquid flowed onto your hand and you burned yourself instead of having a nice cup of coffee, right? So a cup and handle pattern should look like a cup, which means the rim should be up here around 4,300, right? So you have a cup with two even levels and then a shallower pullback that gets back to that same level. So a horizontal line or as close to that at the top is actually pretty important. Some people think of this, and, and I think that's I think that's that's uh that that's that's a stretch, right? The cup and handle pattern really is designed to be more of a static uh peak to or static resistance level. What I would say that what you're seeing maybe as a cup and handle in either of these cases is just the fact that we've made a higher low. And if you think about Dow theory says lower lows. And higher lows, that's more bullish, right? Uh, just basic price pattern analysis. We keep going lower, and all of a sudden we're making a higher low, and it shows that the trend is starting to uh, starting to reverse. Even Elliott Wave, of which I'm not a big user, but if you think of this as some wave pattern, the beginning of a new wave pattern starts with one, and then two, or A, and then B, and either one, it's a higher low that sort of initiates that next pattern. So that idea of a higher low telling you something is different after a, after a downtrend is pretty common with a lot of different techniques out, uh, out there. So I think what you're maybe calling a cup and handle, I would not label it that. I don't think that's necessarily fair. Is it a higher low? And the fact that we've broken above that trend line connecting those highs, is that all meaningful? 100%. I just would disagree maybe with the labeling that you're implying there. Final question here for today, and this is another interesting, thoughtful one. Do you ever receive negative feedback or comments from friends and family about our profession? And you said you're younger, you're just getting started in the industry, you're not getting a lot a lot of uh, you're, you're you're getting a lack of support and things. Well, number one, uh, keep at it, and I wish you wish you the best. I I found the financial industry is frustrating, challenging. Um, you know, it, it is it is one of the most uh, difficult, but one of the most rewarding things that I've ever tried to do for sure. Um, it, there are times when it is certainly not easy, and I wish you wish you well with that. Um, you know, I, I, how would I think about it? I have a couple of big picture things, right? Number one, you have to remember that fantastic things and uh, and and things that you need to improve your life, and not just you, but anybody need money and they need liquidity. So things like buying a house, buying a car, sending your kids to college, retiring gracefully, those all need money. And the financial industry is really built on helping that happen, not just for people with a lot of wealth, but people with a little bit of wealth too. And, and I think that's an important thing to remember. Also, go back to the history of the financial uh, markets. If you read something like uh, Jesse Livermore talking about trading stocks, right? The, the stock market in a lot of ways is a level playing field in that everyone has access. And you look at how easily anyone can access the markets now versus 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 
it is as level of a playing field as it ever been in terms of access, right? In terms of the ability that people have, and just with ETFs, think about uh, anyone, even with a small amount of capital, can you know uh, bet in different things. So I love the fact that the financial industry allows that to uh, to happen. I would say also there's a lot to be done with diversity in the industry, but I think groups like Wall Street Bound that look at uh, you know uh, underadvantaged or disadvantaged communities and getting access to uh, to the industry, women on Wall Street trying to uh, trying to uh, increase diversity as well. I think those are all positive things that happen. And I would also finally say things like the CMT Association, the CFA, that have ethical standards that we all agree to abide by. I think. There are unfortunately in anything, and certainly in the financial industry, there are, there are questionable ethical events that happen through the course of time. I feel very good about being aligned with something like the CMT Association, whereby having that designation, I am agreeing every year to abide by certain ethical standards. I take that super seriously. There are other CMTs that I know take it seriously uh, as well. So I think aligning yourself with a group of that, that you can demonstrate the ethical standards and the goals that you're trying to accomplish. I hope that helps, but, uh, but I appreciate you sending it in and I wish you well. In your uh, in your career, we need to wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is looking at Tesla. Nice move to the upside, and I have to uh, have to acknowledge the fact this is a stock that's up pretty significantly, up another eleven percent today. Clearly outperforming, and uh, you know one of the biggest gainers, certainly the biggest gainer today, I believe, in the S and P uh, five hundred. What's so interesting, though, and I guess just to bring it into context, if you look at the last three years. I would say that run that we've had so far in 2023 is an impressive run off the lows, right? We've gone from 105 up to 175 in a couple of weeks, right? In one month. That is an impressive move. What you have to remember is we were up in the three, 400 range not too long ago, right? A year ago, we were way higher. So even that huge acceleration off the lows still hasn't gotten you halfway up to where we were before. So you have to remember these are names that have been beaten down so much that it's impressive to get a big move off the lows, but it's not that impressive when you think about how much further you still need to go to really get back to where you were not that long ago. I would also point out the fact that Tesla currently is overbought. It was overbought a couple times in 2022. Both of those times were uh, pullbacks, right? Those were the upper end of those rallies. So if you think of this as a bear market rally, we're kind of showing similarities to those previous peaks. I think it's important though, if you are buying more into the bullish case that this is the beginning of a much broader recovery for the markets and especially for Tesla, I would be looking back in like 2020, right? And think about more of a bull market phase and what happened when the stock was overbought. You will find that it's sort of mixed, right? There's some times where we hit overbought, we drift a little higher. Other times where once we get above the overbought condition, look for when we exit the overbought condition. That was a really good indication of the, you know sellable pullbacks or maybe opportunities to buy in on further weakness and playing on the uh, on the uptrend. But the fact that it's overbought makes me immediately want to start to compare it to previous overbought conditions. I would encourage you to make that analysis on your own. Chart number two, finding a stock rotating higher. And again, I just looked for stocks making new swing highs. Pool, which is SCP Pool Corp. It's in the uh, consumer discretionary sector, uh, mid cap name there. You can see this nice rotation from a lower lows through the course of 2022, <laughs> excuse me, to higher lows in December. And how many stocks can say that exact same thing, right? Lower lows through the course of the uh, third, fourth quarter, but all of a sudden making a nice higher low in December and making a nice rotation above the previous highs. This is a stock that I would argue is now recovering and it's now in an accumulation phase, evidenced by the fact that the trend of lows and highs has now reversed. We're above the 200-day moving average. Bad things happen below the 200-day. Good things happen above the 200-day. Let's focus on names that are able to break through that key level. You have to think of the stocks also not working, though. We saw some breakdown in some energy names, although overall, I would say that's a, there's a, a sector that uh, still is in a fairly constructive setup compared to uh, other trends when you look back at the last 6 to 12 months. I want to highlight some of the financial names rolling down a little bit. I'm highlighting Schwab today just to show the uh, Schwab actually made a new low in June, made a bit of a higher low in July, some more of a double uh, bottoming pattern rotated back to the upside. Look at this nice, fairly parallel channel sort of moving up over the last uh, five or six months. We've now arguably broken through the lower end of that channel. A lot of what you can do when you're thinking about price is thinking about trend and when that trend has changed, right? After an inflection point. Big inflection point here in June, July. Have we now made another inflection point where a trend line off of the uh, closes uh, on the low side uh, may indicate that there's further downside from here? Open question for uh, Charles Schwab. 
Folks, that's a wrap for the show and for this week on The Final Bar. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close. We'll be delayed on Monday and Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern, back live on Wednesday after the uh, Fed meeting. Have a fantastic weekend. For StockCharts.com and Revin Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, be safe. We'll see you next week. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.